Tesla's incredible Q1 results mean many things, but I think the biggest, most important takeaway is that the age of the internal combustion engine automobile is well and truly over. Why do I think so? And what are the consequences? Let's take a look and find out. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So this video came out of a combination of two things and I'll put the links to both of those up above. Number one is I did an Ice Age video a while back and number two, we were talking on the live stream over the weekend that I did. And by the way, if you enjoyed that, please do let me know because I'd be happy to do more of those in the future. It was kind of fun. Anyway, as we were talking, some of the viewers were asking questions about internal combustion engine cars and how quickly things were going to change over to BEVs. And it made me start to think about things a little bit more specific specifically about the near-term future rather than the long-term future. So what do I mean by the near-term versus the long-term? I think about the near-term future as like up to like 2025 and the long-term as 2030 and beyond. I think as with many of you, I'm assuming that by 2030, most of consumer vehicles are going to be battery electric vehicles. Assuming of course that companies can make enough battery electric vehicles. That's the big sort of ask at this point. But of course the difference between 2025 and 2030 is a lot of time. There's a big difference between four to five years and, and nine or 10 years from now. And of course, I also wanna note that Tony Saba, who is much more famous than me at predicting the future, is very much a proponent of this near-term switch between ICE cars and battery electric vehicles. So it's not just me talking about this, it's him as well. Anyway, as many people who follow this channel know, ICE cars or internal combustion engine cars are on life support at this point. There's some companies like BMW that talk about selling internal combustion engine cars in 2050. And sure, maybe there's gonna be some weird special case ones where people will wanna drive the old fashioned kind of car. I mean, it's the same sort of thing as like, people still ride horses now, whereas 120 years ago, horses were the primary form of transportation, now they're just kind of a, an interesting thing that, you know, often well-to-do people, but, you know, people who love horses will go out and, and, and ride those around. So I could see in 30 years, right, is that, yeah, 20, 50, 30 years or so, that people might still manufacture ICE cars, or certainly people will maintain ICE cars, and they will drive them as interesting little sideline kind of things, but it will be only be a few thousand of those cars that will exist in the world. They won't be the primary form of transportation anymore. And quite honestly, they will probably be taxed and penalized. Even if people want to drive them around for fun, they will be forced to pay large taxes for the environmental cost of driving those cars. But that's the far term future. That's three decades from now. Why do I think this is a more urgent concern right now? Well, that comes down to Tesla's quarter one report and also what's going on in the rest of the industry as well. The big number in Tesla's quarter one report is that they sold nearly 185,000 cars in quarter one. That is a record for any quarter that they have produced cars ever. And that's huge because their quarter four results were really, really large and quarter one is is always in retail sales of any kind, but especially in cars, it's a very weak quarter and then it builds throughout the rest of the year. So this means that the odds are that quarter two is going to be a record, quarter three is going to be a record, and quarter four is going to be a very big record. And Tesla is on track to sell a million vehicles this year, which is absolutely nuts. It means that demand is crazy and, and other BEV manufacturers that are manufacturing quality cars are seeing very high levels of demand as well. And also there is huge pent up demand for things like the Cybertruck and the Rivian vehicle, the, the Rivian, is it RT1? Yeah, <laughs> there's the RT1 and the RS1, I think, for the SUV. But anyway, for their cars as well. And I think they're going to come to market sometime this year. So a quality battery electric vehicles have massive demand already. So number one, we're already seeing that demand is huge. And these cars are very expensive still right now. So right, we haven't come down to the mass consumer level uh, cost cars at this point. Also, the other factor is that Tesla is expanding faster than people are giving it credit for. It's quite obvious that Giga Shanghai has a new entire area that they're building out. More than likely that is going to be to create the $25,000 subcompact or 
hatchback or whatever kind of car they end up designing. And by the way, if you want to see my version, you can check it out up here. But anyway, so Shanghai is developing into its third phase. Berlin should be online by the middle of the year. And Texas, Terra Texas, people are starting to call it Terra Texas. And I actually like that. <laughs> it alliterates and I'm a big fan of alliteration. So let's just call it Terra Texas from now on because it's huge. And by the way, we are planning to visit Terra Texas and Spaceport in Texas in the next month or so. So definitely subscribe so you can follow along with that. So between all three of these factories, and of course Fremont is always getting better and better at manufacturing vehicles within their small footprint, Tesla is set to explode, if not in 2021, in 2022 to 2023, especially when that new subcompact $25,000 car comes out. And by the way, it appears in the US that uh, President Biden is talking about a now $10,000 incentive for purchasing a battery electric vehicle. If that is around at the time, and Tesla is allowed to do it because they have sold a lot of cars, but if the combination of a $25,000 car and a $10,000 BEV credit happens, holy crap. <laughs> I mean, to get a new battery electric vehicle for $15,000 effectively would be, I can't, I can't even imagine how Tesla would ever keep up with that kind of demand. It will be incredible. So anyway, Tesla is obviously expanding fast. They're also forcing other companies to follow suit. Other car companies are being forced into manufacturing BEVs faster than they probably want to. But anyway, so there's a huge steamroller that's gaining momentum right now. So things are moving faster than most people think. I, and I don't think people are giving that enough credit at this point. So anyway, a tipping point is coming. There, we're, we're hitting the bottom of the start of the very big rise in battery electric vehicles, that S-curve that I've talked about before. You can catch my episode on that if you want to. But I believe we're right at the bottom of the part where it really starts to take off. And so the tipping point is happening somewhere around now. I'm projecting it out to maybe 2025 before all hell breaks loose, but I think that's rather conservative. It might be a year or two before that. Of course, in order to make that tipping point really happen, there's a couple of things that need to happen. Number one, we need cheap battery electric vehicles. And by cheap, I mean at least down to $25,000. That's just gotta happen because the normal consumer cannot afford a car that is $50,000. Even if it's cheaper to operate, that's just the truth of the matter. And the other factor, which we've seen from the demand that's there for trucks, is that at least in the United States, battery electric vehicle trucks that are competitive or better than gas powered trucks need to happen because that is the largest selling segment and the most profitable segment in the United States. So that certainly happens happening. There's a lot of companies that are looking at manufacturing trucks and they're going to start rolling out. You know, certainly the Cybertruck, I think, is going to have at least a few of them on the road before the end of 2021. And they will really start to take off in 2022. And of course, Rivian, on the other hand, is looks like they're set to actually start releasing cars in mid-2021. So that's pretty cool. So <laughs> they should be the first to market with trucks. So anyway, I think there's a lot of pent-up demand, but I think that the other factor is that trucks in the $50,000 range-ish need to be out in order to make people in the United States really, really start to dig in and think that BEVs are better overall. Of course, no matter where you are in the world, EV credits are also going to affect the effective price, right? So like I said, if you have a $25,000 car and a $10,000 credit, then you can get the car very cheaply. In Norway, I heard from a viewer that they're looking at getting rid of the 25% tax break. In other words, cars normally charge 25% value-added tax in Norway, and they're not charging that currently for BEVs. So getting rid of that would affect things, of course, but Norway has also really, really changed already. So uh, it may not matter at that point. At any rate, this is going to happen kind of on a country per country basis, but the moment of phase change is going to happen when the majority of people in a country realize that EVs are better and cheaper. And then things will change incredibly rapidly. And I'm calling it a phase change. A phase change in physics is like, well, just imagine water. So you take water and you cool it down and you cool it down and you cool it down and it's still water. And then it hits that part at zero degrees centigrade or 32 Fahrenheit. <laughs> but anyway, it hits that point and all of a sudden, very, very rapidly, it goes and you get ice, right? So that's the phase change. What's happening right now is that EVs are being pumped into the market and pumped into the market and pumped into the market. And there's going to come a point 
uh, probably when the sticker price of an EV is the same as the sticker price of a normal uh, gas powered car, that people are going to phase change. And so what's going to happen is we've had nothing, 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 and then extremely rapidly, we're going to get a transition where everybody's gonna want BEV cars and nobody's gonna want gas powered cars anymore. Of course, the ability to produce BEV cars, which often comes down to the ability to produce batteries, is going to be a major factor. So people are going to want BEV cars before they can get be EV cars. But here's the thing, people can wait if they want to. And many actually will wait for a BEV car at some point. In fact, I think there's a segment of the population already that is waiting for BEV cars that they can afford or waiting to save up, up enough money so that they can stretch and purchase an expensive BEV car right now. But anyway, there is a segment like that, but that segment is going to grow. And it's going to be a very interesting time period as this phase change happens. And by the way, phase transition with ice, ice cars, water to ice, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, okay. All right, so that's what's happening in the next couple of years. What are the consequences? Well, first of all, as you might guess, anyone who makes ICE cars is going to see their market evaporate overnight. When that phase change happens, people are just gonna stop wanting ICE cars, and that means that if they're producing ICE cars, they're gonna have a whole lot of ICE cars that nobody wants. And if you think that's not gonna happen, think about the BlackBerry phone, at least if you're old enough to remember BlackBerry phones. They were all the rage, right? And also the Palm Trio, I think that was the same thing, which was the little clicky keyboard thing, the chiclet keys with, with the tiny little screen. Overnight, the demand for those phones disappeared. And where is BlackBerry now? And Nokia as well, right? So these things can change. When people decide that they want a product that's a different paradigm product, right? They want something that's more of a, a blank tablet rather than little chiclet keys. The, the demand for the old stuff goes away and it goes away really, really fast. So don't think like, oh, people are gonna want cars for decades, ICE cars for decades after BEVs become competitive because they won't. And consumers, especially with something as expensive as purchasing a car, which for most people is probably the most expensive thing they purchase aside from a house. If they see that there's more quality in waiting a little while to get a better product, a lot of people are going to do that. So anyway, companies that are primarily making their money in manufacturing ICE cars are going to see their market share evaporate really, really quickly. And that's going to be very painful for the company. It's going to be painful for the stockholders. And sadly, it's also going to be painful for the workers. Of course, another major consequence of this is dealerships. Uh, any country that has a dealership model, which is basically that the cars the auto manufacturers sell the cars to a dealership. The dealership then sells to the consumer. So they're kind of a middleman or middle person. Anyway, so they're going to see a massive drop in consumer purchasing. Number one, because a lot of BEV cars are being sold direct, but even for cars that are being sold through a dealership, they're simply not going to have the product for a period of time. There's going to be this time where people are going to say like, don't want ICE cars, there are no battery electric vehicles in this brand, so they'll either go to purchase another brand of BEV or they're just going to wait. So there's going to be this huge lull in, in purchasing of cars from dealerships. And of course, another consequence of this is that BEVs require almost no maintenance for years and years and years. So that means that the whole service model that these dealerships make profits on is going to evaporate as well. So of course, that's going to be a lot of pain for dealerships and many dealerships will probably close. And honestly, I, <laughs> given how much I detest going to dealerships and how that experience is horrible, I don't mind that. I, I'm sorry for anybody who's working for dealerships, but I think you might want to get the resume out and start looking for other jobs at this point. And also let's look at companies that do auto loans. Suddenly you're going to have loans for ICE cars that nobody wants, right? Because if the demand for new ICE cars goes away, the demand for used ICE cars is going to start to evaporate as well. So suddenly people who, you know, put a $40,000 down on an ICE car, the car is going to be worth $10,000 all of a sudden instead of like somewhere around $40,000. So the loans are going to become worthless as consumers have cars that nobody wants anymore. So of course, that's going to be paying for loan companies. There's kind of an ICE car auto bubble that's forming. And that could have huge consequences. If you remember the 2007, 2008 housing market crash when there was a big bubble in housing values versus loans versus credit, et cetera, et cetera. And other things too, of course. But anyway, that same sort of thing can easily happen with these loans for ICE cars. And that's going to have big consequences potentially to the economy overall. And finally, what are the consequences to consumers? Well, anybody who has an ICE car is going to find it has little to no value at some 
some point. I predict around 2025. Some people are saying sooner. It might be a little bit later. But there's going to come a point where ICE cars are going to be worth essentially scrap. And of course, as many people finance their cars, that means that they're going to have something that's really not worth very much. So they're going to have a choice. They're going to either have a choice of ruining their credit by just walking away from the car loan, or they're going to have to pay for years on a car that's going to have no eventual resale value. So a complete loss, essentially. So that means for consumers that are purchasing ICE or internal combustion engine cars, there's a lot of pain for them in the interim until they can pay off the car or they have a choice of ruining their credit if they walk away from the loan. So of course, eventually all this is going to shake out, I would say by 2030, and the environment and the consumers and the winning companies are all going to be better off for it, but there's going to be a painful transition in the meanwhile. So what should you do as a normal average consumer? Well, as the title of this video says, I suggest starting now that you not buy a new gas car. If you need a car today, I would suggest buying a used car because you can get it already depreciated and you really only need to keep it for three or four years, not the seven or eight or 10 years that you would with a new car. Above all, don't get yourself stuck with a five plus year loan on a car that nobody is going to want in five years. Of course, if you can afford it, you could buy an EV car today, but if you're in a situation where you can't afford a BEV car right now and you need them to come down in price or there's some other factors, I suggest hodl, <laughs> right? In other words, like just hold on to your cars right now, keep them as they are, just nurse them along as best you can. Don't buy a car, Don't especially don't buy a car if you're taking a loan out for it, and really don't buy a new ICE car. Uh, you know, buy a new battery electric vehicle car if you want to, or if you can afford it, or else buy a used car if you really need a, a new car right now. But I would not suggest buying a new ICE car anymore starting like right now. Alrighty, I hope you found this episode fun and informative, and I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of comments from people who may have different opinions about this than me. But if you do, defend your position and tell me why you think that ICE cars still have a future and why they're going to be worthwhile in the future. I'll definitely be interested in knowing what you think. In the meantime, if you did enjoy the episode, please do like it so other people can find it, and of course, subscribe for more of this. As always, a huge, huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. I, I love you all. Thank you all so much for your support. It really means the world to me. And of course, don't forget about our merch store, which has this awesome <laughs> Tesla bot t-shirt, as well as don't mess with Tesla, all input is error, and a whole bunch of other things. So check that out and support the channel. Thank you. And finally, don't forget that we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping helps out the channel. Thank you. And finally, don't forget to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.